Imagine a universe where the First World War was fought with crawling mechs, spider legged tanks, exosuit soldiers, and giant walking gunships. In Iron Harvest, players get to relive the early 20th century European conflicts in an alternate historical universe, where instead of wheel and tracked locomotion, the mechanical leg is the vehicular movement method of choice. In this video, we look back on a year since the game's release and see where it stands amongst the classic RTS experiences of old, and whether it's worth your money and time. This is Iron Harvest, a year in review. Announced in 2016, Iron Harvest is the first foray into real-time strategy for German developers King Art Games. A cinematic trailer for Iron Harvest debuted at the games convention E3 2020 and piqued the interest of the RTS crowd who have seen their genre die off a little in the last decade. The game presents itself as a competitive, base-building, real-time strategy game similar to Relic Entertainment's classic titles such as Company of Heroes and Dawn of War, but with an alternative historical twist with its self-described diesel punk theme. The main prominent feature are mechs, human-controlled machines that essentially replace the functions of artillery, tanks and aircraft in warfare. The game plays itself extremely similarly to Company of Heroes, a clear inspiration, and thus we will be making several comparisons between the two in this review. The game released in September of 2020 and won several domestic awards such as the best German game for that year. Paid content followed with the Russ-Viet Revolution DLC released in December 2020, adding a short epilogue campaign. Operation Eagle DLC released in May of 2021 and adds a new faction, Usonia, based on the United States, accompanied with a full faction campaign. Purchasing this DLC will also unlock air units. This review will examine how well the premise and setting of this unique theme is executed and presented, how well Iron Harvest revives the RTS formula, its exploration of the lore in its campaign, and the developer's performance over its year in post-release. The lore of Iron Harvest is based on the world of 1920+, an alternate universe created by Polish artist Jakub Rozowski. This universe diverges from our own around the late 19th century, where the Industrial Revolution was fueled not by coal and steam, but by diesel and oil. This has led to the developments of mechs instead of tracked or wheeled vehicles, and subsequently mechs become a major component of militaries around the world, instead of tanks. As a result, the game's subgenre of fiction can be described as a diesel punk mecha. There's various references to plenty of real-world characters such as Nikola Tesla, believed to be the pioneering tour de force of mechanoid adoption. Unlike steampunk themes, which attempt to showcase the hyper-advanced, futuristic, autonomous benefits that mechs can bring to society, in Iron Harvest, mechs are crude and cumbersome, awkward to pilot and primitive in their impact on human development. In warfare, however, the advent of mechanized technology has drastically increased the mobilization speed and available firepower armies can bear onto their enemies, and it's quite obvious that mechs play a huge part on the battlefield of wars. Many European powers have differing historical contexts in this universe. Germany was united by the Kingdom of Saxony instead of the Prussians, and is now known as simply Saxony with its seat of power at Dresden. Poland and Lithuania maintained their confederation through the 18th century and are now known as Polania. Rusviet is a portmanteau of the words Russia and Soviet, the later pertaining to the governing bodies under the Tsardom rather than the Soviet Union, and Rusviet is a massive empire that represents much of Eastern Europe. These massive factions and other world powers had just fought one another in a massive yet brutal Great War, not dissimilar to our own World War I. Iron Harvest is set in this alternate 1920s post-war period, roughly corresponding to when the Polish-Soviet war broke out in our real world in 1919. Revolutions and dissent over the fertility of the previous conflict threatens to destabilize the newly garnered peace, as well as a looming threat from a shadow organization pulling the strings behind the curtains of a powder keg Europe.
Iron Harvest's presentation is definitively locked within an indie game mantra that resembles the old classic RTS games a decade ago. As a result, in many aspects, it does a satisfactory job of engaging the player, but lacks a severe amount of polish and attention to detail, giving the feeling of a low-budget production that is not able to replicate its interesting concept and Rosalski's wonderful art style. One can look upon Iron Harvest's graphics and be mistaken for resembling a game that's 10 years old. Overall, it is quite dated, but is of an acceptable quality. There's quite a few nice things about the lighting and effects, but the low resolution textures is quite apparent when one zooms in or during the in-engine cutscenes, which do kind of remind me of cutscenes from World of Warcraft or Age of Empires 3, with their janky animations, voice desync and low poly models. However, this isn't a big studio, and if anything, Iron Harvest can be essentially categorized as an indie game, so graphics isn't the highest priority, nor should it be a major criticism. It must be said that the artwork, those drawn by Rosowski himself, and appear in the game as loading screens and user interface art, are top-notch and indicative of a darker atmosphere I would have liked to see the game be built upon more. The indiness of Iron Harvest also shows itself in the UI, which for me resembles the user interface of Paradox games in particular. In game, there are all the essential and classic elements of an RTS one would expect with a large minimap, unit panel, and action buttons. Compared to RTS games of old though, there has been strides to reduce how much screen area the interface takes up, subsequently more screen area dedicated to the action. And this has been a general trend across the entire industry, so no surprises here. It has its fair share of problems though, being more minimized than other games, it's often difficult to tell which units are currently selected, and when using the group function, which groupings they are a part of. This is further exacerbated by the infuriating mouse controls, where it's really difficult to select the right units, especially in the thick of action. Some units have unique abilities and passives, these are placed at the bottom row of the action bar, and as a result it's difficult to keep track of them, and I feel they should be highlighted better. Even in cinematics and cutscenes, there's many grievances with the white-coloured subtitles. Against winter or snowy backdrops, they become virtually illegible. This is some of the various issues with the game's UI, which overall does not provide enough feedback to the player. For music, a clear Eastern European folk identity is portrayed, perhaps because Iron Harvest's scope is predominantly from this region. The soundtrack is catchy, uplifting, but nothing too special to write home about. The sound design is pretty good, there's a lot of unique cranking mechanical sounds that bring to life each unit in the game. Hearing mechs move in the distance gives me the sense of that one scene from Saving Private Ryan. Explosions and gunfire are pretty weighty and have decent bass, again each unit showcasing unique sounds. Combined with the various radio chatter from units, action-filled sequences can be particularly noisy, chaotic affairs, but that is reminiscent of the atmosphere from Comedy of Heroes. The voice acting can leave a lot to be desired, and combined with the atrocious mixing makes it really gnarly and sharp. The audio option also doesn't seem to control this, so I'm not sure what's up here. There is also a native language audio option which lets the Polanian, Rusviet and Saxon factions talk in Polish, Russian and German respectively, which is a really cool and flavorful touch, although it does get kind of weird in cutscenes when you have multinational languages being thrown around and the characters seemingly understand everything. Günther von Duisburg. Co za niespodzianka? Wie kann ich Ihnen helfen, Kommandant? Iron Harvest certainly has problems with its lower budget engine, especially when lots of assets appear on screen. And this is disappointing since the game isn't too great on the appearance side, so you'd expect better performance as a compensation. During chaotic battles with a large amount of units, the frame rate can be jumpy and sporadic. 
frame rate drops can also accompany input lag, which causes button presses to not work half the time. In-engine cutscenes also seem to stutter constantly, and cinematics suffer from audio desync, bad mixing, and are locked to 30 frames per second. Performance is thus a weak point and can definitely be optimized further. Three game modes are offered in Iron Harvest. The first is Campaign, which we will explore further in depth in the next section, as this is Iron Harvest's main selling point. Missions are solo play against the AI, Skirmish mode is your classic configurable RTS setup, whilst Challenge mode sees the player attempt to last as long as possible in a defensive position against waves and waves of enemies. Finally, Multiplayer, which is pretty much skirmish lobbies with online players. Skirmish is further divided into Dominance Mode, essentially a port of Company of Heroes where players must accrue victory points by capturing and holding strategic positions. The first team to reach the target victory point wins the game. Drop Zone is a unique take on the victory point mode by dropping stockpiles on the map at random locations, with teams scrambling to capture them to accrue victory points. Finally, the classic Annihilation Mode where the first team to completely destroy the other team's buildings and units wins the game. The gameplay of Iron Harvest is virtually consistent throughout all the modes, however, and centers around a point capture system akin to Company of Heroes, or any other Relic Entertainment RTS for that matter. Various resource points are scattered throughout the map, which can be captured and recaptured with infantry. Iron mines and oil pumps provide the respective iron and oil resources, with iron as the game's main and most utilized currency. Oil is more rare and produced more slowly and used for upgrades or advanced units. These nodes give a set per minute amount of resources and can be upgraded one time to big iron mines and big oil pumps, which double their accrual rates. At the beginning of matches, various crates of resources are also scattered across the map and capturing these yields a one-time influx of resources. Strategic positions are available in dominance mode and capturing these nodes accrues victory points. In the campaign mode, strategic positions are implemented as major objectives for the player and they must capture or defend them to progress missions. There are three vanilla factions available in the base Iron Harvest and one available as a DLC faction. The Republic of Polania is based on Poland, a predominantly agricultural based society. Their military doctrine is focused on mobility, with their lighter but more agile units able to outmaneuver other factions on the battlefield. In RTS terms, they can be described as the Rush archetype. The Tsardom of Rusviet is based on Russia and has strong industrial capacity and a huge surplus of manpower to draw from. As a result, their units often excel in close range and melee, getting into their opponent's faces and overwhelming them with superior firepower and numbers. They are the powerhouse or brute force faction and should aim to press offensively across all stages of the game. The Empire of Saxony is based on Germany, with a modernized military, powerful industry and proud military tradition. They have some of the slowest but tankiest units in the game, thus they are chiefly defensive in nature with immense offensive potential in the later stages of the match. Therefore, they are the turtle archetype. The American Union of Usonia is available with the Operation Eagle DLC and is based on the United States, with highly advanced technology allowing them to specialize in deploying air units, providing a major advantage over European factions. Their units emphasize burst damage and area of effect, with the ability to move and deploy units to parts of the map quickly. As a result, they can be simplified as the Raider or Harassing archetype. There are three base buildings and several defensive structures available to all factions. The Headquarters, which provides minor resource income and access to engineers and basic infantry. They also provide access to the Reserves mechanic, which we will cover in a little bit. The Barracks deploys basic and mid-tier infantry. Upgrading to the Advanced Barracks opens up heavier infantry and manned weapon systems. The Workshop deploys mechs and exoskeleton infantry. Upgrading to the Advanced Workshop provides access to more advanced and heavier mechs, war machines and artillery platforms. Engineers can also build defensive structures outside the confines of the main base to enable security of key battlefield areas. Each faction gets to build a type of fortified position, similar to Company of Heroes. 
These fortified structures can be garrisoned by infantry to provide great cover, and upgraded to field heavier weaponry, each faction having a unique building with unique upgraded weaponry. For instance, the Saxonian pillbox can be upgraded to field a shrapnel grenade launcher, and upgrade one step further to field a high explosive cannon. The Usonian bunkers, on the other hand, to complement their aerial superiority, can be outfitted with a flamethrower, or one step further to airdrop a squad of paratroopers on demand. Many maps also spawn with a multitude of buildings which can be garrisoned by infantry, providing great cover to fire from. Besides these fortified positions, all engineers across all the factions can construct sandbags to provide basic cover, barbed wire to prevent infantry movement, and mines to cause damage to mechs. As a classic RTS game, there is a population cap, and population management can also be seen as a resource. This cap determines how many units you can field simultaneously, and can be increased by building and upgrading the barracks and workshops. All factions essentially field these same infantry units, with minor differences in their fielded weapons. All factions have access to the Engineer, which can construct buildings and repair mechs and weapon systems. They are armed with pistols and thus provide almost no offensive firepower. All factions have access to a form of basic infantry. The Polanian riflemen have long range, low firing rate, and high damage bolt action rifles. Russoviet vanguards are armed with shotguns, strong damage and decent fire rate, but can only fire at close quarters. Saxon stormtroopers armed with submachine guns have medium range and high firing rate, a balance of the three factions. Usonian volunteers are armed with semi-automatic rifles, essentially a medium between the Polanian riflemen and Saxon stormtroopers in range, damage and firepower. Grenadiers are an upgrade on basic infantry and although perform the same in combat as them, they have access to grenades which makes them adept at clearing cover or grouped infantry, or for some anti-armor capability. Gunners are infantry armed with hand cannons that provide decent damage against mechs. Flamethrowers are specialist anti-infantry units, their flames, although short range, ignore cover and building protection bonuses. Medics can heal units at the front lines but provide little combat firepower. Machine gunners provide heavy anti-infantry firepower at a decent range and can suppress infantry. Despite cosmetic differences, all these other infantry types are functionally identical and accessible across all factions. Infantry are however very versatile in Iron Harvest, and the infantry system is one of the game's better appreciated mechanics. Infantry can proactively switch their typing by picking up different weapons, dropped by other dead infantry or through weapon crates, which also spawn randomly on the map. For instance, engineers can pick up basic weapons and become the faction's default infantry, picking up grenades converts them to grenadiers, and picking up machine guns converts them to machine gunners. All infantry can also commandeer weapon systems, some of these are also scattered around the map. This heavily rewards crafty players who can micromanage well, as infantry can essentially be converted to different roles depending on the needed purpose or developing combat situation. Weapon systems can be procured at the advanced barracks or commandeered on the battlefield. They can only fire whilst deployed and have limited firing arcs and can be repaired by engineers. Heavy machine guns suppress and annihilate infantry, dishing out minor damage to light mechs as well. Field cannons are anti-mech guns, piercing armor with deadly accuracy, and offer some minor damage to infantry. Field mortars lob shells over large distances, great for damaging infantry in cover but doing almost nothing to mechs. Like infantry, weapon systems are virtually identical across all factions. Where factions are differentiated and distinct is in their roster of mechs, although they still fall within discernible categories. Each faction, for instance, will have access to a heavy exosuit wearing infantry. For instance, the Polanian Reserts infantry are armed with shields and hand cannons, the Saxon Eisenhans are armed with mortars and battering rams, and the Rasvit Grozes are pure melee possessing jetpacks that fly into close range with their armor slashing razors. This is the same across all the mech types, with each faction able to produce a light mech, usually used for recon or scouting, a medium mech for infantry support, a heavy mech for anti-mech capability, a super heavy mech for pure durability and firepower, and an artillery mech for long range damage. The differences in mech weaponry and armor reflects the faction military doctrines and tactical styles. For example, the Rusviets deployed the Serp as their heavy mech, armed with terrible blades to slice into other mechs at melee, whilst the Saxons deployed the Wotan as their heavy mech type, 
armed with two long-range anti-mech cannons. Another example is the Polanian Mochni artillery mech which can fire close-range shells whilst mobile or deploy to fire long-range in its siege configuration, as opposed to the Rusviet artillery mech, the Nakovalnya, which fires a barrage of rockets at once with a super long reload time. Included with the Operation Eagle DLC, factions can field airships which ignore terrain and are useful for surprise attacks across the battlefield. All factions have access to the airlift, an infantry transport vehicle, the Skybike, a fighter that is effective against other airships, and the Gunship, which deals heavier damage at the cost of speed. Only Usonia has access to unique airships, but they forego having a super heavy ground mech in their roster. The Revere is armed with rockets capable of damaging air units and ground targets, whilst the Samson performs the role of a drone bomber, delivering long-range firepower. Airships seem like a natural expansion path for the game, but currently they are a bit overpowered because enemies have to build specific units to counter them, and are quite cumbersome to control because of the game's maximum zoom making it difficult to select air units. All factions also feature their own roster of unique heroes. Many of these will be encountered in the campaign mode and can be deployed in skirmish, providing strong abilities capable of turning the tide of battle. Each faction has access to three heroes apiece, one light, one medium and one heavy. Light heroes are great in the early game pushes and infantry focused battles, such as Polanius Anakos, who wields a one-shot sniper. Medium heroes provide a balance of mobility and decent damage to contribute firepower wherever they are needed, such as Saxony's Prince Wilhelm and his personal mech, armed with missiles and dual repeaters. Heavy heroes provide the decisive late-game push needed to mount game-winning offensives. Rusviet's Colonel Zubov and his heavy melee mech can propel into battle with rocket-fired engines and tear apart any opposing armor whilst Usonia's Admiral Mason delivers destruction from the skies in his capital airship. Again, they reflect their faction playing styles as well, such as the Saxons fielding the massive Brunhilde mech, which is armed with broadside cannons and a heavy havitza, exemplifying the faction's methodical yet devastating turtle strategy. Or the Polanians fielding Mikhail Sikorsky and his contingent of winged hussars, which charge into battle with their sabers, rifles, and sticky bombs, indicative of the faction's fast pace and agile playstyle. Faction heroes are chosen during the skirmish setup screen and are deployed to the battle with the reserve system. This is a mechanic that allows players to set up two battle groups of assorted units and deploy them to the map at the headquarters for a lump sum. Useful to plug defensive gaps quickly, to employ in rush strategies or reinforce in the late game when resources are plentiful. Reserve 1 is made up of tier 1 units such as infantry and weapon systems, light and medium heroes, whilst Reserve 2 is made up of tier 2 units such as mechs and heavy hero types. Combat in Iron Harvest resembles Company of Heroes to a T, and many of its mechanics are essentially copy and paste, but lack as much depth compared to that title. Like that game, infantry can take advantage of cover to reduce the chance of oncoming projectiles hitting. Cover is dynamic and can be destroyed by heavy shells or squashed by mechs. Same goes with buildings, as some of the heavy and super heavy mech variants can simply walk right through them. Mechs also provide cover to infantry behind it. Uncovered infantry will suffer from suppression delivered by certain weapons such as artillery shells or machine guns, pinning them to the ground, reducing their damage they can deal and their move speed. Opposing units that converge together at close range will begin to attack in melee, with some units carrying dedicated melee weaponry. Polanian riflemen, for instance, carry bayonets on their rifles, which provides the bare minimum of melee capability. Besides the Rusviets, though, you should generally try to keep your units at maximum range. Depending on armor type, armored units are impervious from certain weapons. The heaviest mechs in the game cannot be pierced by conventional weapons and barely sustain damage from even anti-mech or armor-piercing shells. Similar to Company of Heroes though, mechs do suffer twice as much damage if hit from the rear, and thus positioning and flanking maneuvers on the battlefield are key. This is not a game where throwing away units is advised given the economic cost and small scale of troop sizes. Like Company of Heroes, you can and should retreat infantry forces if the firefight is going poorly, where they will retreat to the closest friendly building and can be reinforced. Mechs can be repaired by engineers whilst in action, however. 
Units gain experience when they perform tasks in battle, such as healing, repairing, capturing points, or dealing and sustaining damage. Units advance from a base rank to become veteran, then to elite, gaining stat boost and unlocking veterancy abilities, varying from unit to unit. These abilities unlock more methods to make that particular unit more versatile. Some examples include how veteran medics can construct aid stations, a forward base for infantry to recuperate at, whilst the Saxon Wotan mech attains a pair of rockets at veteran rank, giving it an extra firepower edge. In conclusion, the gameplay of Iron Harvest feels a lot like the first Company of Heroes, almost to the point where innovation was sacrificed to retain tried and tested elements, and veterans of Company of Heroes will recognize a lot of those aforementioned. Even in comparison to other RTS games, it lacks replayability, like a tech tree system to make every game unique, even if you pick the same faction. Unit variety is really only felt with mechs, and although they are well designed, they do suffer from janky movement and a considerable lack of polish with the issues we brought up already. Units suffer from the rock-paper-scissors formula without too much dynamic variety. You see this unit on the enemy lines, you make a unit to counter it. You get countered by the enemy, you make another unit to counter that. Every faction has essentially the same buildings and there's no uniqueness in the base building gameplay loop. You make a barracks, you make a workshop, you upgrade them, done, that's all there is. There's even a lack of unique victory conditions besides the classic victory point and annihilation modes. Iron Harvest delivers a solid game but doesn't innovate the RTS formula enough to bring anything substantially worthwhile to the table and that is unfortunate because mech warfare is a thematically interesting topic that perhaps hasn't been given the foundation it deserves. The vanilla campaign follows a typical three-act narrative structure, each covering an individual faction, with Act 1, the Polonia campaign, establishing most of the world building and introducing some of the key characters. Act 2, the Rusviet campaign, increases the tempo of the story before the climax is delivered in Act 3, the Saxon campaign. The Rusviet Revolution DLC offers a short story that immediately follows the events of the Vanilla campaign, whilst Operation Eagle DLC offers a fully fleshed out act for the Usonian faction. Besides delivering a fairly cohesive, action-packed storyline, the large stretches of gameplay in between cutscenes and story content will provide players with ample opportunities to be accustomed with game mechanics and the differences between the factions. Each campaign act will allow players access to most of that respective faction's unit roster and gives a sense of playing styles, tactics and metagame knowledge players can then carry over into skirmish and multiplayer. The Polanian campaign is the introductory act and serves as the game's tutorial, as well as doing much of the world building. The story follows a village girl, Anna Kost, living in occupied Polania, with the Rosviets controlling their country, due to the disparaging peace settlement brought upon them after the Great War, causing resentment to patriots who wish to see a free Polania. As Anna journeys with partisans fighting behind occupied lines, her family is entangled with the Rusviet High Command who have a deeper, more nefarious interest in some experimental weapons designed by the Saxons. On this quest to save her family, she becomes a sort of Joan of Arc figure for the Polanian resistance, participating in key battles of liberation and introducing players to a variety of scenarios to teach the different game mechanics such as the cover system, unit types, base building and the economy system. By the end of the Polanian campaign, a secret organization called Fenris is revealed to be behind the Rusviet's aggressive counterinsurgency offensives intending to reignite the Great War. Other key figures of the story are also introduced, ready to be fleshed out in the rest of the campaign. The Rusviet campaign occurs in a simultaneous time frame with the Polanian Act, dwelling heavily into the Rusviet perspective on the events within Polania. St. Petersburg is hosting the world's military and political elite in a peace summit attempting to resolve the Great War. However, an insurgency attack threatens to derail the talks, targeting key leaders of interest such as Tsar Nicholas. The campaign follows Olga Morozova, a loyalist secret operative of the Tsar, tasked to uncover the mysteries behind the St. Petersburg attack, which is soon revealed to have been initiated by Fenris, another one of their many attempts to restart the Great War. 
As a result, subterfuge and clandestine operations make up the large part of this chapter, with stealth missions a focus, introducing a unique way to approach the gameplay in Iron Harvest. By the chapter's end, the player will be introduced to historical figures such as Kaiser Friedrich and Rasputin, each having their share of lore and story influence. The pioneer of the universe's mechanized technology, Nikola Tesla, also becomes a pivotal part of the story, and another key target of the organization Fenris. Players will also get to have their first proper taste of the game scale of Iron Harvest with massive mech battles and the chaos of action showcased in its entirety. The Saxon campaign follows the stoic veteran Gunther von Duisburg. Widely respected in the Saxon military for his tactical prowess and victories in presumably the universe's wars of German unification. It flashbacks to his perspective during the Great War, leading the Eastern Front against the Rusviets, with the Saxons expecting a quick and decisive winter campaign with their offensive through Polania. It also introduces Prince Wilhelm, son of Kaiser Friedrich and Crown Prince of Saxony, an ambitious glory hunter who is second in command to von Duisburg. The opening parts of this act feature some of the hardest fought missions in the campaign with a steeper difficulty compared to the previous acts. As the Saxon army encounters greater and greater Rusviet resistance, the Saxons will be forced onto the defensive, and players will experience the intricacies of that style of warfare, learning how to fortify and hold the front line before performing their own counter-attacking maneuvers. This wasteful meat grind of a campaign instills disillusionment of the war's progress onto the two generals, causing tension and ultimately a rivalry between the two. After the war, Gunther is implicated in an assassination plot against the Kaiser and must flee Saxony, hoping to seek asylum with Nikola Tesla. The campaign culminates into a huge finale of a multinational battle with mechs, alien walkers, prototype weapons, and a chaotic injection of every sci-fi trope under the sun. Following the main story campaign, Rusvit's turmoils after the Great War develops into a full-blown revolution, inspired by the real-life Bolshevik revolution. Olga Morozova makes a returning appearance and helps the Tsar escape revolutionary forces out for his head. Believing Fenris is behind the revolution and Rasputin as its head in Rusviet, Olga must escort the Tsar to St. Petersburg to retake the capital and inspire a loyalist defense of the country. Despite its short length and a real lack of substantial story content with limited cutscenes and narratives, it was one of the most chaotic campaigns by far with a huge difficulty spike over the vanilla campaign. The Usonia campaign is simultaneous with the events of the Rusviet Revolution. In this universe, Alaska is still part of Rusviet, with the Americans only having business interests in the territory. These are threatened with the revolution, and the Usonians go on the offensive, occupying the state to protect American investments. They use this as a pretense to justify an interventionist foreign policy, getting involved in Arabia, which is fighting a guerrilla war of independence against their Saxonian colonizers. This campaign is pretty indicative of, and almost a parody of, the American involvement in the Middle East, and how the first for oil affects both the Saxonian and Usonian desire to conquer Arabia. This is the longest campaign of all the five acts, and features extensive cinematics and cutscenes, but besides a general overview of how the Usonians play, also introduces the new dynamic of air units and the dynamics of air combat. The 30 hours or so of content in the Iron Harvest campaign is the meatiest and thus most worthwhile part of the Iron Harvest package. The campaign was a great way to learn the game and presented different mission types such as train escort missions, RPG focused escape and stealth missions, all the way to commanding massive battles that make up the core skirmish experience. The campaign however did drag on unnecessarily in some parts, often resorting back to its repetitive base building loop which as we explained in the previous section, suffers from lack of variety. The lore is clearly well thought out though, filled with political machinations, diplomatic tussle between major nations and a strong foundation of alternate historical world building, but it suffers from an excruciating lack of realism or a grounded approach to make it believable or immersive. Iron Harvest portrays itself 
as almost fantastical and the final parts of the story breached so many multitudes of scientific absurdness that I found myself questioning if this was really a mech game centered in the 1920s or some sci-fi flick. Iron Harvest was definitely released last year as a quote-unquote semi-finished product, with the developers intending to incorporate community feedback to bring about changes in what is almost like an extended beta for post-release. This has seen almost monthly updates that have added new features and content as well as patch issues and to rebalance units. This includes the introduction of a cosmetic system to offer some sense of progression and reward, where winning matches and completing campaign missions or challenges rewards the players with coins that they can buy cosmetics to customize their loading screen art, multiplayer profile or add some skins to their units or a codex to organize all the tidbits of the game's lore. Almost every update is paired with new skirmish maps as well, and Iron Harvest now boasts a healthfully large variety of many sized battle maps. On a more concerning note is that it has taken into the post-release period just to implement some basic mechanics that are often taken for granted in the RTS genre, and even more critical in a multiplayer included game, such as engineers and medics being able to repair and heal allied units engineers being able to dismantle barbed wire, a ping system, or even the ability to cancel upgrades in progress. Judging from the amount of fixes and changes over the course of 20 or so change logs, I shudder to think the state of the game at launch, though perhaps it speaks to the willingness of developers to continue working on the game despite an obviously small budget and team. However, the fact that the game can still be considered unfinished even a year after launch, pending further updates and optimization, may rub some potential buyers the wrong way. The Rusviet Revolution continues the vanilla campaign, but the fact that you are still controlling the Rusviets and not the revolutionaries, coupled with the fact that there is a measly four missions, no custom-made cutscenes besides dynamic artwork, makes it resemble more of a Rusviet campaign epilogue. There isn't much of a story here to tell as well, which is quite disappointing. The Operation Eagle DLC is however much more content heavy, and what one can truly call an expansion pack, a fully fleshed out faction based on the United States with a hearty campaign to boot. Its addition of airships, although currently imbalanced, brings a different dynamic to the ground-based warfare we've seen so far in Iron Harvest. I'd love to have the addition of a British and French faction coupled with their respective campaigns, just to experience the lore and the great war of this universe from a Western European perspective. It would be pretty cool to see a faction based off the Empire of Japan as well, since this time period was important in this nation's imperial aspirations. Rozelski's universe is also the basis for a board game called Scythe, which includes a Togawa Shogunate faction present in Japan, a Crimean Khanate faction present in Crimea and the Caucasus, and a Nordic Kingdoms faction appearing in Scandinavia, providing an obvious expansion path for the future of Iron Harvest. Furthermore, the modding scene is more currently reflective of the game's ongoing development, but Iron Harvest does seem like the type of game that is able to enhance its longevity and replayability through a combination of community modding and strong expansion support. A twist on the early 20th century with mechs replacing tanks. An interesting lore and premise is unfortunately built upon a very shaky, fantastical sci-fi approach that doesn't really bring much immersion or realism to the experience. 6 out of 10. Iron Harvest's lack of polish is apparent in its budget engine. The game comes off worse for wear but should be reasonably playable in most systems. Room for improvement and optimization. 5 out of 10. The gameplay is amusingly chaotic at times, but consistently engaging enough, bringing back the classic RTS experience but with mechs pounding at each other. The lack of innovation and formula breaking mechanics however greatly hinders its replayability. 6 out of 10. Iron Harvest's extensive campaign is its most attractive feature, transporting players through a well-constructed narrative and offering a taste test to experience every faction's strengths and weaknesses. The story does get somewhat convoluted though and falls into typical overdramatic science fiction trappings. 7 out of 10. 
The game released haphazardly in a fairly lackluster state, but consistent monthly updates have improved its outlook. One year of progress does seem inadequate however, and this title will need some more time and effort to brew. 3 out of 10. My final rating for Iron Harvest is a 5.5 out of 10. Iron Harvest has kept its debut pricing at 50 US dollars, but is a game that is constantly on sale. The game is also available on the Epic Game Store for the same price. With the given rating, I'd advise to at least wait for one of the numerous sales. The game was as low as $10 US during the recent 2021 Steam Summer Sale, and this makes it quite a cheap investment for a solid 20 to 30 hours minimum of content. A disappointing DLC with a campaign bereft of any meaningful narrative or world building with missions that players have already experienced in the vanilla campaign. Even at its measly price of $3.99, I'd probably advise to skip 2 out of 10. This is in fact a well formulated DLC that is reminiscent of the old RTS expansion packs such as Tales of Valor for Company of Heroes. By introducing a fleshed out, unique faction, an accompanying campaign and new air units, it adds a dynamic improvement to the core gameplay. It costs almost as much as half the base game though and probably more viable on sale. 8 out of 10. Iron Harvest attempts to bring mech warfare into a time period that is often associated with the rise of tanks, through justifying a thoughtful but overhanded approach to a nevertheless interesting alternate historical setting. Its gameplay lacks depth and replayability, its presentation a want of polish and optimization, and it will struggle to build a fan base to contend with the established titans of the RTS scene, which is already seeing some competition, such as with the upcoming Company of Heroes 3. If this game was released a decade ago, it would probably be better received, but as it stands, this tried and tested formula without substantial innovation unfortunately falls far too flat in this day and age. This was Iron Harvest, a year in review. This review is possible with the support of our patrons. Consider helping us make more analytical content like this by subscribing to us for as little as a dollar a month.